Welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. My name is Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. Before we kick off this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, we'd like to ask you a favor. If you're coming back to the show because you enjoyed the previous episodes, or if you're a first-time listener, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell now. By subscribing and hitting the bell, you'll be notified of each new podcast, and you'll really help us to build this channel into something more special than it is already. We hope you'll check out our website at thebigbasspodcast.com. There you'll find all of our shows, special bonus material, our exclusive Big Bass Podcast calculator, and lists of all the state and world record bass. So let's get started, Ken. Great episode that we're recording right now, Terry. It's uh, it's all about one of the greatest world-class bass lakes of all time. And you know, we've we've done some shows about uh, California, uh, especially in the early days of California. We did a terrific episode. Uh, with regard to Orville Ball, the California Florida Bass Experiment, and also with Jim Brown. And we've got the links up here somewhere to those episodes. And, you know, back in the early 70s, uh, beginning really, at least to my mind, with Dave Zimmerle in 1973 when he caught a 2015 out of Lake Miramar, all eyes were on California to produce the next world record largemouth bass, uh, to break George Perry's record that had stood for more than 40 years almost 40 years at that point. Yeah. Um, but but it, initially it was the San Diego lakes, the lakes that, that Orville Ball and, and Jim Brown had helped to, to bring to the forefront of the big bass world that we thought it was going to come from. You know, places like Miramar, or San Vicente, or, or Murray. But then in 1980, a, a new body of water really hit the, the front pages of the big bass world, and that's when Ray Easley uh, caught a 20-pound fish out of Lake Casitas. Yeah, and and this story is dear to my heart. I remember this vividly uh, as a kid. I was still, my mom was still driving me to the tackle shop to work. I was just about ready to turn 16 uh, when this actually happened. And it was uh, March 4th, 1980. I walk into the back entrance of Bob's Fishing Tackle in Norwalk, California, and walk through the back room and uh, up to the counter and, and Bob looks at my mom and says, you better hold Terry. And I looked at Bob and I said, why? He goes, we just got a phone call a couple hours ago that a 21 pounder was taken out of Casitas. I had to pick myself up off the floor. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, nobody was expecting it. You know, yeah, I mean, they had just caught some really big fish out of there. They had caught a 15, they had caught, you know, some, a 19, Bill Beckham had caught a, a I think it was like 18.5 or something like that in January. Uh, but to, that to fish was fish... actually eight. I'm sorry, Terry. That fish was actually 18.11. And as you say, middle of January, 1980. Yeah. So, so folks like you who were paying really close attention, you knew about that fish, but, but then to, to raise the stakes almost three full pounds to where Ray, where Ray easily landed, uh, yeah. awfully impressive. Oh, it was nuts. It was absolutely crazy. And you know, they had, caught you know quite a few of uh, you know like i said other big fish they had a, a 16 15 uh, in 79 they had a 15 8 in 79 there was a 43 pound limit that was caught out of there in 79 by a guy uh, by the name of uh, wayne carlton uh so there was a lot of those you know low to mid teen fish that were coming out of there but nothing uh, other than beckham's fish that had approached 20 pounds and it was still a couple pounds off or a pound and a half off and and so yeah, it was. Uh, it really took everybody aback a uh, when when this happened. Uh, but we're not going to talk about you know the big fish rally of Casitas for the most part. The 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 pur- purpose of this show is to discuss what happened to Lake Casitas. Uh, it, it isn't you know most people say well you know it's just the, the typical lake cycle it's going to you know be pro productive at the beginning years and then it's going to taper off and uh this isn't the case with with this particular reservoir and a lot of reservoirs in california you just to give a this is a very high high overview of of casitas and where it was because i consider a world-class largemouth bass to be 18 pounds and up 
you know, then you're right. within that four, four and a quarter of the current world record. And so I yeah. consider 18 pounds and up. And, and Casitas produced a couple of those fish in 1980, but then you got to go into the 90s before you see another one. And, yep. and the last one that I have on my radar, at least, came from the mm -hmm. early 2000s. So although it yeah. produced, let's say, six or eight of these fish in that in that 18 to, to 21 pound range, uh, it was pretty sporadic and it was stretched over a, a 20 plus year period. Yeah, absolutely. It you know, you're not talking the San Diego lakes, which are tiny compared to Casitas. Casitas is twenty five hundred surface acres. Uh, and again, it's got ultra clear water. Uh, it goes, it would in the seventies, eighties and nineties, it was, it would go through, uh, drought periods where it would lose maybe, you know, 15 to 20 feet of water over the four or five drought years that there would be, you know, all the cover would grow back and then you'd get two or three years of, of good rains and the lake would come back up and it was like a new body of water. The shad would replenish the spawn would have a place to hide the whole nine yards. Uh, and so that's why you see these sporadic, you know, catches of these really big teener fish. But the lake always produced, always produced hundreds of fish a year in that 10 to 15 pound range. You just never heard about them um, unless you live there, A, or because nobody's going to write about a 15 that's coming out of California. Who cares about it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's so it, true. So anyway... Uh, but to understand, you know, what happened to Lake Casitas, we kind of got to go into a deep dive of, of a couple of, of different topics. First off, it's the, 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 the Califor California water and its effect on the biosphere. And then this invasive mollusk called the quagga mussel. Those are the two things that, that killed the lake. Uh, and so uh, let's, I guess, get, dive into the, the background of this 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 watershed so yeah, you know i come from florida and i know you're from california terry in florida almost every body of water in the state is natural created mm -hmm. by hurricanes by sinkholes things like that and of course california if not for for man-made reservoirs would basically be just a desert yeah it's 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 got one more natural lake than texas does texas has caddo and that's it California has Lake Elsinore, which is uh, in Southern California, and it's got Clear Lake, which is in Northern California. The only two natural lakes in the entire state. Everything else is a reservoir. California is a desert. Uh, it, on average, in Southern California, gets 12 inches of rain a year. Now, we have some weeks that we get 12 inches of rain here in Tennessee, and I'm sure there's probably a couple of days that you'll get 12 inches of rain in Florida. Absolutely. So, and, and, and then you have the population that is pulling this water, which is why all these reservoirs were constructed, was to give people water to drink, water to irrigate crops, et cetera. So, yeah, but, water is very precious in California. Yeah. So what we want to do real quick is look at the, the Ventura River watershed, which is the watershed that is Lake Casitas is within. And the Ventura River uh, is created by the confluence of five creeks. Metalia Creek, North Fork Metalia Creek, San Antonio Creek, Canyana Larga Creek, and Coyote Creek. And these five creeks feed the Ventura River, mind you, which is only 16 miles long uh, and only runs in the January, February, March, and maybe April time frame. And it runs from the mountains of uh, the, the Los Robles National Forest into the Pacific Ocean. Now, you have this watershed which covers about 225 square miles, which is about a 15 by 15 mile square. Okay, so it's a small area. And between the beach and the hilltops is a 6,000 foot difference in elevation. All right, so. You can imagine what happens if you get a, 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 a rainstorm uh, that comes in and they come in about every five to seven years and they'll get 17 inches on the ground at the beach and they'll get 30 inches of rain in the hills and all that water just washes down. And uh, that was a, a major problem in Southern California, especially for the people that were trying to settle in the Ojai Valley in the 40s, is that 
all of a sudden you've got this torrent of water running through town, washing houses away, washing crops away, cattle, the whole nine yards. So in 1947, uh, the community uh, in the area decided that they were going to look at the build, in, into building a dam on Metalia Creek. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, did a study on it, and they came back and said, yeah, no, there's too much silt in the runoff. If you build the dam, it's just going to silt up within 10 years, and it's going to be a useless reservoir. So what did they do? They built the dam anyway. Uh, typical. And, you know, within... Uh, Literally within a few years, you know, the thing was half full of silt. Um, and uh, the dam, when they constructed the dam, now mind you, the Ventura historically supposedly had uh, a run of steelhead, the Southern California steelhead uh, strain uh, that would go up the Ventura River and, uh, and, and do their thing. Uh, I never heard of a, of a steelhead in the river when I was there, living there. Uh, and, but in like 1997, someone spotted two of them. I don't know how they got there or what. And we should, we should point out that a steelhead is a rainbow trout that has run, gone into salt water. It's not a regular rainbow trout, which we call bait fish here on the Big Bass <laughs> right. Podcast. Yeah, exactly. It's not, as Ken would say, vitamin T. Uh, vitamin T. Anyway, so... You, you've, you've got this, uh, this dam that's been constructed. Uh, it's not, it, it's almost silted in, uh, and it is, you know, not doing what it was intended to do. Then in the 1950s, the people that were in, the, in, in Ojai and the surrounding farmland realized that, you know, we, we come through these severe drought periods and we run out of surface water. We have no water to drink and we have no water to uh, irrigate our fields with. And so they proposed building the Casitas Dam in the early to, to late 40s to early 50s. Uh, they built the Casitas Dam. Uh, it was finished in 1959. And that's what formed Lake Casitas. So I, you get... <laughs> Terry, you know a thousand percent more about this story than I do. And that's why you're taking the lead on this one. But what I do know about is uh, a little bit about the name, and I mm -hmm. thought it was a, a fun story. So I'm going to interrupt you here because this seems like the right time. Um, Casitas is a Spanish word that means little houses, little houses. I think most of us could probably figure that out. But there was a big controversy in the late 1950s about what they were going to call this lake. Uh, the water is coming out of the Ventura River. The local town is Ventura. The county is Ventura. There's a bunch of people who want to call it Lake Ventura, but they lose out. They lose out to Lake Casitas. And uh, I thought that was really interesting. There was a guy named, his name was Howard N. Rockefeller. Not Rockefeller, Rockefeller. And uh, he thought the name had historic significance and that it was really important to name it that because that was a name the, the area was given by the Spaniards when they came to the Indian villages uh, hundreds of years earlier. So that was a big deal to them. They, they ultimately put this thing to a vote of the Ventura River Municipal Water District, and it won three to two. Um, and before that, they had just been calling it the lake that is forming behind Casitas Dam. I mean, <laughs> hundreds of articles talking about the progress on this project, and all they can say is the lake being formed behind Casitas Dam. Uh, <laughs> But I love this, this uh, comment from the Ventura County Star Free Press in uh, September of 1959. Uh, this is, this is uh, right after the vote. They're talking about the names Ventura or Casitas, and they say they're both pleasant seven-letter words that fall trippingly off the tongue. <laughs> okay, well, I, I learned something about my favorite lake in the world or my past favorite lake in the world. Um, tonight so thank you <laughs> that was some good information <laughs> happy happy to make a contribution <laughs> anytime anytime anyway so the dams constructed in 58 they start filling it up and when they dammed they did not dam the ventura river the ventura river does not feed this canyon that casitas was built in it's coyote creek and the santa Ana river uh is what forms lake casitas the 
the lake again was 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 put there in order to provide groundwater and drinking water for the people of Ojai, Ventura County, uh, and provide irrigation water for their, their, their crops and their cattle at the time. Um, and it was also used for flood control of the Santa Ana River and the, uh, the Coyote Creek. So the problem was is that the height that they built the dam and with the, the seasonal influx of Coyote Creek and Santa Ana River, they knew that those two tributaries would never fill the lake. So what they did is they built what they call the Robles Diversion Dam and Canal. And essentially what that did is that in the winter time and the early spring when the rains would come, the rainy season, uh, what they could do is they could fill the Robles Dam up and then divert water through the, the dam into a canal. And then that canal would follow, I think it's uh, Highway 150, down to uh, the Santa Ana River. And that would then dump into Lake Casitas. And so you would get this influx of water from January through uh, March, you know, in the years that they did have rain. And that's eventually what filled Casitas. And Casitas did not spill. It did not go over the spillway until 1977. So here you got a lake that was finished in 59, and it didn't spill until nearly 20 years later. So that kind of tells you what the, what the water situation is in that, in that part of the, the country. Uh, very, very limited water, uh, and you really have to rely on, on heavy rains. So let's talk about the, the early years of the lake, Ken. Um, you know, you, you've got its first opening in the, in the late 50s, uh, provided great fishing for, you know, crappie, planted trout. I mean, they were planting trout in there in the, in the late 50s and early 60s. You know, northern strained bass, catfish, and red ear sunfish. Uh, and then in 68, thank you to uh, Orville Ball and, and probably Jim Brown had something to do with this. And Florida. Their, and Florida. And, and Florida. We can't leave, can't leave Florida out. California's a, primary benefactor. They got their first stocking of 200 fish from Lake Otai and Lake Hodges of the Florida strain largemouth. So do you want to pick it up here, Ken, or...? Well, I know that uh, obviously getting Florida bass is the key to putting Castaic on the map in the Casitas. Florida bass world. Come sorry, Casitas. And Castaic, which we're going to cover in a later episode, by the way. But, yeah. um, you know, it, it, by the mid 70s, uh, Terry, and you can tell the story far better than I can, but um, the, the main 70s, people were still primarily focused on the San Diego lakes, like we were talking about Miramar, yeah. San Vicente, Murray, and places like that. Uh, mm -hmm. But Castaic was, Casitas, I'm sorry, was producing some some bigger fish. And and Castaic at that point wasn't even the picture because they had only finished construction on that particular body of water in the mid-70s. Yeah. Um, but beginning in, um, in, in 1979, uh, you had some big fish start, start to show up. Fish over 16 pounds, fish over 15 pounds. Uh, a giant stringer averaging better than 8 pounds. We mentioned Bill Beckham's 1811 in January yep. of 1980. And then, of course, 20 pounds is a magic number. And, and in March of 1980, Ray Easley catches a 21-3 and, yeah. and shook up the world. You know, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the 20-pounder the basically after Zimmerly. We're yeah. talking about a fish that at that point was, was basically the second biggest certified legitimate largemouth bass anybody had ever seen. Um, yeah. And yep. so that, was, that rocked the world. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was insane. You know, uh, like I said before in the op in the opening, you know, I mean, it, it, it took me to my knees. Uh, it, it took everybody to their knees, I think. All right. Now, and, you said you, your boss there at the tackle shop said, told your mom to hold you. Was it because you were going to be so excited or you were going to be heartbroken that someone had caught a 21 and it wasn't you? Both. I mean, it was literally <laughs> both. You know, I, at that point, I think I'd been fishing Casitas every weekend since the beginning of December. I know that my dad and I fished Casitas that Christmas Eve and that Christmas Day. Uh, I mean, we fished it Thanksgiving Day. I mean, it was, 
it was the lake to be at in the winter time because you knew that that's where that next big fish was, or you had a really good chance of it. You know, you didn't want to go to San Diego because everybody was in San Diego, yet you could go to Casitas and there would be, you know, maybe 10 boats on the water in that, you know, 78, 79, and 80, well, 80 up to a point time frame. Uh, so, yeah, I, I put a lot of time on that water and... Uh, I was happy it was caught, and I was sad that it was caught. <laughs> what were the crowds like on Casitas after Easley's fish? Oh, it was nuts. It was absolutely, within a week, it went from you would maybe see on a weekend, on a Saturday or a Sunday, you might see 40 trailers in the, in the parking lot, to they were having to come up with overflow. There would be a 1,000 boats on a 2,500-acre lake, and if you walked in the parking lot or looked at the, uh, the, the license tags on the sides of boats, you were seeing boats from Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Texas. It was nuts. Uh, I remember uh, Bill Beckham uh, actually guided Roland Martin for two weeks out there in 1980. Uh, I remember Jimmy Houston going out there because uh, the, the boat dealer that dealt Monarch Boats, which was about five miles from my house, uh, one of the salesmen was a good friend of mine that used to come in the tackle shop, and they had to provide a Monarch boat for Jimmy Houston because he was fishing a Monarch at the time. Uh, it was, I mean, everybody was out there, and it was literally like going to the meat market uh, and having to wait in line. You'd go get a ticket to wait in line just to get on a point to fish. Uh, the infamous rock pile, it was literally, you could walk boat to boat, you know, for, you know, a hundred yards. It was nuts how many people now, were on that lake. Obviously, Casitas had the recipe that a lot of other lakes, a, a lot, a few other lakes in California had. They had the yes. Florida strain bass. They had rainbow trout as, as heavy protein forage, that's dumb, easy to catch. The truck is backing up every week, dumping these stupid eight-inch trout in there, or however big yeah. they might have been at that time. What else was it about Casitas that made it special, if anything? The water quality. So, it would in the in the winter time when we would get rain, uh, a lot of nutrients would get flushed out in you know through uh, Coyote Creek and the Santa Ana River. So you had a, a ton of nutrients that would get in there that would then, you know, feed the plankton and, and all that stuff, which then the shad would feed on. Uh, and then the bluegill. I mean, the, the biodiversity in that lake, for being a, a reservoir that never had fish in it, was, was quite amazing. Uh, so you had that. But then from about, as soon as the rain stopped, the lake would become crystal clear. You could read beer cans in 30 to 40 foot of water. Uh, and, and that allowed the fish to do a lot of sight fishing, even in, in deep water. You know, 40, 50 feet of water, uh, it's a lot easier for a, a fish to catch prey, if it can see it, than just having to rely on a lateral line. Now, uh, in, terms of, in terms of structure and cover, obviously this is a canyon type reservoir. Yeah. It's deep, it's clear, a lot of yep. rock, a lot of points. Uh, yeah. but there's, there's no standing timber or submerged timber. Is there, there's no, no, no. there's no grass. So yeah, no, there was, there's grass as you would refer to it in the South. There was none of that. Um, when they inundated the lake, they went and bulldozed and took out pretty much all the trees. Uh, cause I mean, you're talking a lot of oak trees in that area. So they, they got rid of all the oaks. Uh, and pretty much everything else uh, before they filled the lake up. So you're talking uh, about, but you're talking real fertile ground. So, you know, when the lake would go down, let's say, you know, five or 10 feet, 20 feet, you know, over a course of, you know, maybe three to five years of drought conditions, you would get grass, as in lawn type grass or weeds or bushes that would start growing. The ground's really fertile. And, and so you would grow all this cover back in that drought period. And then when the water would come up five years later, these fish, you know, bluegill had a place to spawn and their, their 
their you know offspring would, would would survive. Same with the bass. The shad spawns were prolific in that lake, uh, and it was just a, a real good. It was interesting to, to watch because you know I'd always hear about these lakes you know going through these life cycles, and it seemed like like Casitas and a lot of those Southern California lakes would go through a drought cycle, but as soon as the drought cycle ended, then the fishing would pick back up again because now you've got a new brand new lake. So that was, that's the difference between these, these reservoirs in, in Southern California especially than any reservoir in Texas or, or what have you. So, And of course um, the, the big water fluctuations in terms of water level that we see in canyon type reservoirs, highland type reservoirs occasionally. There's something that I, I've seen because I've, I've been lucky enough to travel around the country and, and fish, but uh, here in Florida or in the deep south, we, we generally cannot identify with those kind of, of water level swings. Right, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I, in, in these severe drought conditions that we would have out there, the, I think the most that I ever saw Casitas drop was about 30 vertical feet. And that was a lot. Um, and, but it would remain that low because, you know, they, they didn't want it to drop any further because they were worried about, you know, the, the wells going dry for the farmers and all that stuff. So they pretty much maintained it. It wouldn't drop below 30 feet, uh, usually below 20 feet. Go ahead. What, what makes them drop that far? Is it just drought? Yeah, it's a drought. You know, they, they've got to release water. Uh, a little bit of water or it's just the groundwater because th that lake what it's doing is it's replenishing the aquifer that's in that valley and so if you have farmers that are you know pumping wells that are way uh, miles away from the lake they're pulling water out of that aquifer that Lake Casitas is filling okay and so as they're feeding their cattle or they're watering you know their avocado uh, trees or or you know, spraying you know, watering lettuce or what have you. I mean, that valley agriculturally is is pretty robust when it comes to growing stuff. And you know, when you've got farmers that are pulling thousands of gallons a day out of that water table, Lake Casitas is going to continue to go down, even if they're not releasing water uh, out of the dam, which in the summertime they hardly ever released water. Uh, and of course the lake only spilled I think two or three times 77 maybe in 83 or 84 and then I think one time in the 90s it spilled uh, you know when was it most productive in terms of water level was it was it at its best when it was high at its best when it was low it was at its best fishing wise when it was high always um, and again I, I, I attribute that to well let's say it was best when it was high, and then it trailed for three or four years after that. Um, when, when the water level was down 30 feet, were you still able to launch a boat? So when they were filling the lake, what they did is they built launch ramps so they could fill, so they could get people on the lake. So there's launch ramps at quite a few different elevations uh, at the lake. Uh, right now, and what we're going to do in a little bit is we're going to put up a... Uh, 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 a, a time-lapse video from 2006 to 2021 to show you what Lake Casitas has done in, in that 15 years, uh, dropping-wise. Uh, it's lower than it's ever been right now. Um, but So what they had is they had all these launch ramps, but the, the years that I fished it, from 1972 to, golly, last time I was there was in, 2002 uh, we were still pretty much launching off the main launch ramp that everybody launched off of uh, in in those years uh, I think maybe there was two or three times uh, during that period that the water might have gotten low enough to where they had to use the auxiliary lamp that was below the main ramp there at the main uh, the main ramp so it wasn't that bad but we got a, a Ventura County rainfall uh, graph that, that Nathan's going to put up here at this time for us right now. And, and you can see these peaks. And, and, and you'll go, you know, one year you'll get torrential rain, and then you'll go three or four or five, and you'll have well below the, 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 the average. 
The average for Ventura County is 17 inches a year. Uh, there are years here, like, uh, what was it, 19, uh, 1977, they had 45 inches of rain in one year in Ventura County. That's, a, you know, that's four times the, the, the or five, three times the normal amount. And most of that water gets blown out into the Pacific Ocean. It's not safe. Yeah. So it's, it's not seeping into the aquifer if there were one. It's just washing across the surface. Yeah, exactly. Because you've got, you know, if, say you're getting 45 inches of rain down at sea level. Uh, at 6,000 feet, you're probably getting 90 or 100 inches. And it's only got 16 miles to go from 6,000 foot of elevation to the Pacific Ocean. And hence the flooding and, and, and all that stuff. So anyway... Uh, you can see by this graph that you'll you'll get two or three maybe uh, good years of rainfall and then boom you're you're back down below average for three or four years and and you'd always see the fishing pick up that first year that you had that high rainfall and then it would tail off uh, after that once you go back into drought conditions because you know when, when the lake gets smaller there's not enough places for you know fish to hide and uh, all that type of thing. So, but the other thing that, that you know, you, you got to consider is you've got 1997 rolling, you know, around the corner when when a biologist found a couple of supposed steelhead in the Ventura River, and uh, that kind of changed everything uh, from you know in, that was the first nail in the coffin. Uh, that killed Casitas because now they're talking about and doing uh, they're not going to divert much water from uh, the Ventura River into the Robles Dam and uh, Diversion Canal to fill Casitas up. Uh, they're interested in trying to keep the Ventura River running uh, so these salmon and steelhead can come up the river and spawn. Uh, and so now from 1997 you look at that graph again, uh, you're going to see just a constant downfall of the water level. And that's what, you know, that was what hurt, you know, the lake to begin with. Um, so we got, we got the, the California steelhead that are now trying to be protected. They've been put on the endangered species list. Uh, and so this would be a good time uh, for, for Nathan to, to put up that video that I have uh, taken from Google Earth images from uh, 2006 to 2021. The lake's at roughly 30 to 35 percent of its, uh, its maximum capacity right now. And you can kind of see what's happened to the lake. Uh, there's been talk about removing the Matia Dam. Uh, since 1999, but the problem is, is that it's completely filled in with silt, and they just can't remove the dam and allow the 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 rainwater, the runoff, to take that silt mm. downriver, because what happens then? You get mudslides and mudslide, yeah. You know, that's that's a season in California. You've got what uh, drought, fires, Your drought season, mudslide season, forest fire season. And then earthquake season. Earthquakes, yeah, I forget. Yeah, you, have the, you have all four yeah. seasons. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so they, they're they having problems figuring out the, 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 the silt. You know, what are they going to do with all this stuff? Uh, and in my eyes, the, the 30 years that I lived down there and the 30 years that I spent driving up and down that coast going to Lake Casitas, I honestly have never seen the Ventura River run into the Pacific Ocean, except for in heavy rain years in January, February, and March. And, and so for the bass fishermen, it's one of the reasons why we, we came up with the Southern California Bass Council was we felt that we had zero uh, pull in Sacramento uh, with the politicians to, to stop things like this, or at least look at them intelligently. Um, Go ahead. Now, now, I've learned from you that uh, that steelhead run uh, was never what I would think of as a, a big thing. And I understand that, that, that California steelhead is a protected species now, but it doesn't seem like it was ever a really big 
a biological event. I mean, we're not talking about a lot of fish. So all the reading that I've done said that, and this is how they phrased it, said that the Ventura River used to be the home of up to, up to 5,000 steelhead a year. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a lot of fish. No, it's, it's not. And if you know anything about steelhead, I lived in Idaho for a while and 20 years and, and actually fished steelhead and, and got into that. Uh, you know, they, they rainbow trout that get confused and go out in the salt water. They live out there for anywhere from three to, to, to five years. Uh, and then they'll come back up in that river that they respond in and, and, and lay their eggs and do their thing. Well, if you have a river that that doesn't reach the ocean for years on end, how could that be a sustainable, you know, yeah, it's, it's not. it has to be luck of the draw. And I don't think that the rain in Southern California has changed for the last millennia. You know, I mean, we're talking about droughts that, that were happening in the, in the 40s and the 50s, you know, 100, 100 years ago which is why they built Matia and, and, and Casitas dams to begin with, was to have water storage for those drought years. And so it just, it's always confused me as to how, how people can think that, that, you know, getting rid of Lake Casitas uh, is going to help the steelhead run. It, it just, it doesn't make any sense to me. But the steelhead wasn't, but put the nail in the coffin, the last nail in the coffin, with, it, with respect to the trophy fishery. It was Jerry Brown, wasn't it? No, I'm kidding. I don't know. Well, don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Gavin yeah. Newsom. Gavin Newsom did it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, Jerry Brown was uh, another interesting character. It, it, God help California. Um, anyway. <laughs> well, okay, what was, the, what was the, the final nail in the coffin for Casitas? Well, if it wasn't if it wasn't the effort to save the four steelhead that were still attempting to use the river, it was a quagga mussel, and and so in roughly 2007, uh, quag now mind you, California, Southern California has no natural water. It is a desert, a classic desert by definition, uh, and so for everybody to live there, they have to have water. So what did they do? California bought the rights from Arizona and Nevada to get all of their water rights for the Colorado River. So we wow. essentially took all the Colorado River water, and that's what fed all the San Diego lakes. It's what fed a lake in uh, uh, Southern California called Lake Matthews. Uh, it would fill Prado Dam, for, uh, which is another unknown body of water that doesn't have much water in it to begin with ever, but in certain conditions it does. Uh, it's what built uh, Diamond Valley in the late 90s. It's all Colorado River water. Uh, and then you have water that comes from Northern California. You've got the Feather, Feather River Project. You've got the uh, California Aqueduct, the LA Aqueduct. So California, Southern California is bringing water in from the north and from the east through the Colorado River. Well, in 2007, they discovered quagga mussels, which is a, like a, a zebra mussel uh, that you would find in Lake Erie. And that sent the, the California Metropolitan Water District into a tizzy because these mussels have a tendency to plug pumps, uh, plug pipes, uh, essentially wear and tear on equipment, and they wanted to keep the the quagga mussels out of California. Which is that because there are like a lot of other freshwater mussels? They they need the flow of water because they're filter feeders, so they they manage to migrate somehow to areas where there's current. Well, like so, a pipe or something. So Lake Havasu uh, believes that they figured out that it, they got tracked from a, a private boater probably a bass fisherman that had been fishing Lake Erie uh, or somewhere that had, had, you know, quagga mussels in it, uh, came out, let's just say for a tournament, we'll blame it on a bass fisherman, uh, came out, fished a tournament at Havasu, released his live well water, which had the larva of the quagga mussel in it, and boom, next thing you know, 
like Havasu's got quagga mussels. Let's not blame the bass fisherman, Terry. I'm sure. <laughs> well, you could I'm sure you could we blame... can find another scapegoat. Well, yeah, the wakeboarders. You know those wake boats. The, the have... wakeboarders, yes. Yes. The so wakeboarders, the, wake... the jet skiers, or as as I like to call them, lake lice. Those yes. those are the culprits here. Yeah. So the, and it, it's highly possible because those wake boats have five thousand gallon ballast tanks that go in the back of those boats to fill them up so they can really push a good wake. Uh, and maybe, you know, one of these guys, you know, released their ballast tanks in Havasu and therefore released, you know, all these muscles. I well, say it's without a doubt. Without a doubt, it was them. Probably. Okay. Anyway, uh, so because Havasu is feeding all the San Diego lakes, within months, every single San Diego lake, San Vicente, Murray, Miramar, yada, 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 is now reporting they have quagga mussels. So you get a little water district like Casitas Municipal Water District that doesn't have much money and they don't have, uh, they have a, a, a population that they have to guarantee good water. They said, okay, yeah, we're shutting Lake Casitas down. We're going to, if you want to fish the lake, uh, you have to bring your boat. It has to go through a boat inspection. In the beginning, it was the, the clean and dry uh, campaign that, that the Southern California Bass Council put through. Uh, in other words, you would drive up to the lake. That's not the, that's not the effort to help the homeless in San Francisco, the clean and dry? Never mind. No, no, no. So you'd, you'd do this, uh, this clean and dry campaign. You would go there, you would be in line, you'd, go, you'd, you'd pay your entry fee, and then the inspector would come out and would look in your bilge uh, would take a, a cloth and, you know, run it down there to make sure there was no standing water. Same thing with your live wells. Your boat bunks had to be dry. Everything had to be dry. One drop of water, and they wouldn't allow you on the lake. And that lasted for about maybe a year uh, when Lake Casitas said, screw it. If you want to fish our lake, uh, we're going to make you quarantine your boat at Lake Casitas. In other words, you would take your boat, you would leave your boat there, they would inspect it, it's clean and dry. Now you're gonna leave it here for a week to 10 days. And once we're guaranteed that the thing is clean and dry, then you can take it out on the, on the water, all right? If you wanna take your boat home, we're gonna put a, a tamper-proof ID on your, your bow eye strapped to your your boat winch, and if that the only way that you can launch your boat is to break that thing, and if it comes back here and it's broken, you have to go through the quarantine again. So that that right there, you know, the fishing went from anybody could go fish uh, to now you've got to have a dedicated boat to fish Lake Casitas if you want to, or that's the only lake that you're ever going to fish again. And then it went even crazier. Uh, they were so worried about bringing in foreign water that they stopped trout plants for three or four years completely because they were afraid that these pristine spring-fed uh, you know, hatcheries that, that were in the eastern Sierra were, would have quagga mussels in them. So you went from a lake that now is, you know, it's losing its capacity, you know, 5% a year or more, uh, and, and now you've got, you know, no food for the fish because the lake volume is decreasing. The forage is decreasing. And I'm not just talking trout. I'm talking, you know, the shad population, bluegill and all that. Uh, that's eventually, you know, what, what put Casitas in the position that it is in right now. And it's, it's not recoverable unless they finally decide to start refilling the lake. So. Uh, a, a devastating story. Um, yes. And, and you, I guess if I were to have a, a, a takeaway of any significance here, Terry, it would be that first in, in doing some research for this story, this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, the first thing that struck me was I thought there were a lot more giants coming out of Casitas than there were. You know, it first hit our radar with Bill Beckham and Ray Easley back in 1980. Yeah. Uh, but there really were not as many 
world-class bass coming out of casitas as i thought there were and i didn't know all the challenges facing the lake at that time i knew something about the 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 fact that there were very small reservoirs in california that were producing these giant fish i knew that they were uh, experiencing a ton of pressure i knew there was limited time that people were allowed to be on the water they, these lakes were only open three days a week or something like that but uh, i had no idea of all the challenges i had no idea of all the uh, stakeholders in this whether it's the steelhead people or the the farmers or, or whoever it might have been who was who was fighting for water fighting for water yeah. quality fighting to to prevent quagga mussels and things like that but uh and and california is is ground zero for uh people who are trying to do great things environmentally but i'm not always sure they're accomplishing them and uh well, it certainly has has reduced a, a once great trophy bass fishery to uh uh, a lake that is is no longer significant on a on a world class bass stage. Yeah, I mean, if you get a seven pounder out of there now, that's a big fish. It's sad. It, Rich Tauber still guides out there pretty much every day, uh, and I mean, yeah, they catch a lot of you know three pound fish and four pound fish, but you know, I think the last eventually, every once in a while, they get a twelve, you know, a thirteen or something. Um, but, you know, nothing like it was in the, in the heyday. And they did get a lot of, you know, 17-pound-plus fish out of there. You just never heard about them because, A, people didn't want the crowd to show up. Right. Uh, and, and, B, you know, what's another 17 out of California? You know, who's going to talk? No one's going to call Bassmaster and, and, you know, let the nation know about it. So, yeah, I, you know, you, you look in the in the records and stuff of the written record, there isn't much other than the fish that we mentioned. But if you lived down there, you knew of the, the, the 17s and the 16s and the, you know, the 18s that did come out of the lake that never got reported on a national basis. So um, it's a sad situation. I, you know, is there is there a potential for it to make a comeback? I highly as, a, as a world-class bass fishery. No, no, that's, that, it's my opinion. I hate to say it because again, it's, you know, over my lifetime, it's the, the, my favorite lake. Um, and, uh, I don't see them ever, uh, giving the water to the lake that is needed to, to keep it up. Uh, and you know, it's all about the 5,000 steelhead as far as I'm concerned, which is the, the wrong thing to do. So. Siri, it sounds like it is time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. Uh, but before we go, uh, please remember to subscribe, like, share, give us a comment or a review maybe. Uh, it's a small ask, but it truly is a big help to us. Uh, and don't forget to check out our website at thebigbasspodcast.com. You'll find our Big Bass Podcast calculator and our listings of record bass plus supplementary material on the episodes. It's a work in progress, but if you like the show, we think you'll really like TheBigBassPodcast.com. And if you want to contact us, our email addresses are Ken at TheBigBassPodcast.com, Terry at TheBigBassPodcast.com, and Nathan at TheBigBassPodcast.com. I'm Ken Duke, and on behalf of my partners, Terry Batisti and Nathan Benson, thank you very much for joining us. Be sure to check back next week. We will have a brand new show about a different big bass with a story that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size matters.